Welcome to Austria, welcome to Styria, and welcome to Graz, where we are at here. You see our clock tower, our beloved uh, city site uh, on this slide that you have maybe seen now several times on our web pages and everywhere. And when we started to prepare for this conference four years ago, we didn't know what to expect. We jumped into this without a lot of preparation. And it was a long journey. Many people have contributed and helped us, to whom we will thank actually the closing session. Uh, but some of you may remember that from the beginning when uh, this conference in Graz was announced at Interspeech in San Francisco, we used a recurring musical theme to remind you how joyful such an event can be, starting from its announcement until its actual execution today. And this is how we will start again today. So this has allowed all 2,000 people to come in here in this hall. So this is a new interspeech record to have more than 2,000 participants. <laughs> and I will give you some information on you, the participants, that uh, we have collected. So as of uh, September 14, we were around 2050, and we looked at some of the statistics that we observed. So the larger portion, obviously, is uh, full participants, but we have around 30% of students, which means over 600 students and early stage researchers are here and are contributing to our field and give us the chance also to welcome them all here. If we look at countries, I took the liberty, being this still the month of September, to combine all countries from the European Union together, including some countries who are not so sure about it. And that <laughs> gave us a total of 700, and then we go down the range and there's even a few more countries. So we really have a widespread audience from all over the world. And as an Austrian, I'm of course also very lucky that compared to last year, we could even multiply the number of participants by four this year, still being a tiny number, but very happy about this. Uh, we started for the first time uh, also in the interest of ISCA a little survey, and out of uh, the 2,000 participants, uh, about 1,100 responded to our questions, and i just give you a first glimpse on this. ISCA will further analyze these data. So our gender distribution is about 80-20, male to female, which is maybe not a surprise to you. Uh, we also have five diverse uh, members, uh, which is good for our general diversity, and there will be a special event on Thursday lunchtime organized on diversity in ISCA. Uh, regarding work environments, uh, the distribution is, again, quite interesting. 60% academic, 40% from commercial backgrounds. These are scientific participants. It's not our exhibitors, so it shows that our field is really heavily resting on two shoulders, and I think that's good that we have this continuous scientific interaction between these two large uh, uh, parts. So, our conference topic, just to remind you of that, crossroads of speech and language. Where are we now? Well, in this little red country, and what is special about the location where we are? Now, by zooming into it, you may remember that this is exactly where the Germanic, Romans, and Slavic language families meet, so it's really a crossroads in many senses, and you will also experience this in our technical program. How can we make this possible? Well, first of all, of course, all of you had to pay 
administration fees. Luckily, they didn't grow, that actually they fell compared to the last few years. And this is due to our very generous sponsors that I show here that are not only generous in terms of supporting the budget of this conference, but they also offer a lot of possibilities to interact with them and please make use of it to maximize your conference experience. We also have supporters from the local community in particular. It's not me standing here alone as a representative of the University of Technology, but all other universities in Graz have contributed, and even the University of Maribor, which is a different country, but still it's just 60 kilometers away, and we are glad to have uh, Strako Kacic as my co-chair being present also today. <clears throat> I have to now introduced to something that will carry us through all these opening closing sessions, social events. We are in Austria, so this is the country of music, and we will try to put a lot of effort into our music uh, presentations. That was possible because we could tightly cooperate with our University of Music and Performing Arts here in Graz. And if you want to learn more about the composers and the, in particular the artists presenting uh, you the music, please you in your conference back where we have a nice music program for you. This morning we start out with a very special piece which is appropriate for a speech conference. It's called Voices and Piano, which uses speeches of famous people as an inspiration for the artist to make his composition on the piano. And we are glad to have Alexander Radulova here for the piano and Winfried Rich who will support this with live electronics. And the first... <laughs> the first of the pieces we will hear is about Hans, the, the voice of Hans Eisler, where you can see here a picture from the 40s. And let's listen to this interesting piece. We had some concerts, some lectures there. The stage, publi the stage publishing house prints the, the symphony of mine. I had also talks with the publishing house. And this was a, sh 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 a stay for five, six weeks, I would say. Naturally, I got my fee from the publishing house, as every author gets from every publishing house in the world. now a communist and I remember I made when I was a young man, 1926, an application for the German communist, but I found out very quick that my artistic activities, uh, I couldn't combine my artistic uh, activities with the demand of any political party, so I dropped out. See, I'm, I'm not now a member of the Communist Party. I try to explain to you, as I made 1926, an application for the Communist Party in Germany. But I didn't uh, uh, 
follow the activities. I dropped out. I got an answer that I was not active in political groups. But I, I, I wouldn't call, I, I, I was not really a member. I didn't, I didn't pay my dues. I didn't pay membership dues. I didn't, uh, was active in a, in a political organization, the Communist Party. I can't uh, understand your question, Mr. Chairman. I mean, I have a vacation to a job. I'm not maybe, uh, 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 you, it is so. You make an application, you get an answer. I, I did need not really a job. I got an application, I got an answer, but I neglected the whole affair. I told you, Mr. Chairman, I repeat, I made an application, but neglected to say. This is my answer, Mr. Chairman. Right. Well, on behalf of the technical program chairs of InterSpeech 2019, both Björn Schiller and myself, uh, I welcome you to Graz. And uh, as Gernot already said, we have a record number of participants, and that is obviously reflected also in the technical program. So uh, there's a huge program awaiting you. We've got uh, already had a day of eight tutorials, but there's four keynotes, there's 115 technical sessions, in blocks for 10 days, there's 10 survey talks, there's a hackathon presentation, all of this spanning over 15 technical areas. That's quite a lot. And uh, you obviously have a very colorful program uh, that uh, shows all the diversity in the different areas. The tutorial day was already a great success in the reflection of what, what is to come. We had uh, eight tutorials out of, uh, selected out of 12, chosen by the tutorial chairs. We had more than 650 participants. And, uh, the smallest uh, participant number on the tutorial was 50, the average was 80. So I think this was a great day yesterday and uh, lots of people enjoyed that. So uh, we have show and tell sessions. There's 34 out of uh, 44 and this time we did something slightly different. We asked people to produce videos and uh, to, to help the selection process and these videos will be made available after the conference. And uh, some of them are really professional made, some of them were just made by phone and it was I think a good idea and, uh, and, and worked really well. Survey talks. This is a new addition uh, to InterSpeech. This, these are meant to be um, talks that, that uh, give a review, a survey of the state of the art in a certain field, and we wanted to ideally cover all the areas. There will be one survey talk running in this hall every, every single session, and, uh, and these talks will take about 30 minutes and, and hopefully will give you great insights. There will be special issues on uh, speech communication and uh, CSL journals following up that uh, and, and hopefully get these surveys in, into paper form. Special sessions. We have 10 special sessions this time. And interestingly, this time we have 50% of those that are associated with challenges. So challenges on the quite the diverse things. Some of them very local. This is about Styrian, the local region dialects but also we have diarization, zero resource, uh, voice spoofing, and, and so on. So please attend these special sessions. What else? Well, the rest of the technical program, quite obvious, how it came about. You wrote the papers. Uh, we, allow, we provided the facilities to upload. The reviewers read them. And the area chairs decided and actually met here in Graz to make the final decisions and to discuss the papers themselves. And we organized and moved and so on. Area chairs, of course, for a conference of this size, the number of area chairs that, that, that organize in the various sessions is huge. We had 42 area chairs, and this year, because of the size, we organized it so that we had a lead area chair for each area, which are underlined on, on the slides as well. Of course, you can also see these, uh, these area chairs listed on, on the InterSpeech 2019 webpages as well. 
So thank you very much for the RHS. They did a fantastic job, and they had a lot of work and a lot of work to do as well uh, as, uh, uh, in selecting this process. So record numbers of participants, and we already had an inkling that that was going to happen when we saw the number of submissions that we had received. We had 2,180 submissions to interspeech. That's an up of 20% to the largest interspeech uh, before. From these, of course, we, you know through the review process, as in previous years, people withdrew papers after the first week uh, deadline. But still, the number that actually went to review, 1,855, is up by 20%. And what is astonishing is the number of different authors that we had in these submissions. 4,900 different authors in the speech, com speech community. That's a fantastic number. Also, we have, uh, uh, the, the, the institutions are a bit harder to count, so we have between 1,500 to 1,900 uh, different affiliations that we could measure. And relating that to the percentages that uh, Gannett represented on the participants, you can see that sort of we have this around two-third, one-third one split between uh, sort of academic institutions and, uh, and uh, commercial institutions in those evaluations. Uh, and about 5% associated with government institutions. If you just look at the authors, the, 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 the percentage for the uh, academics is slightly higher, but again, these are sort of slight variations around the same theme. What was interesting to us as well was that uh, when we look at the authors, we can also see that 17% of the submissions are actually having authors from different sectors, so academic and commercial or government and commercial and so on. And I think that's a great number, and I think it, it shows that this community knows how to collaborate across boundaries. From these numbers, we had an acceptance rate of 49.3%. 914 papers were accepted, and you will see all of those in the coming days. The submission process was normal, nothing out of the ordinary. People certainly made use of revising the papers on average four, and some people did more than others, but nothing out of the ordinary. Everything worked reasonably well. The papers were reviewed. There were 1,394 reviewers, uh, and again, the split in terms of the different types of affiliation uh, is roughly, again, around the two-thirds, uh, one-third, and between three and five percent for government institutions. The reviewers were coming from 62 countries, and a total of 5,879 reviews were provided. You can see here on the diagram the sort of number of reviews per reviewer that uh, sort of uh, were provided in terms of uh, histogram. So what were the chances of success when we look at sort of the, the, the scores that reviewers gave for the various categories like novelty or clarity or correctness and those kinds of things? So if you look at individual reviews, if somebody gave you a top mark in, in, in novelty, you had about a 77% chance that your paper got accepted. It goes down to one of the new questions that we had added, reproducibility of science, which is 60% chance of success if you got the top mark there. If you, ha however, got a six grade on the overall recommendation of the paper, there was a 90% uh, percent chance from a single review uh, that the paper was going to be accepted. So high scores, uh, definitely a good thing. We also correlated the different types of scores, uh, and I apologize that this is a bit uh, small to read there. So what you have here is the reviewer uh, confidence, you have the correctness scores, you have the quality scores, you have the, the, um, uh, um, the novelty score, reproducibility scores, uh, and you have the overall recommendation correlated with the final acceptance decisions. What you can see is that the overall recommendation scores correlate with all the other scores, but otherwise the picture is very mixed. And so you can also see that the correlation with the final decision is not immediately obvious because obviously more than one review goes into the final, final decision of the process. And so you can see the complexity uh, of the situation that the area chairs faced themselves. One thing is that struck us really strongly is when we looked at the acceptance rate across the number of authors that a paper had. If you managed to get the paper accepted, when you wrote the paper yourself, you did extremely well. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's much tougher. However, if you managed to assemble 12 or more authors to work with you, 
that's what it, well, uh, that's really a good chance of getting accepted. So the message here is find your collaboration partners for the next papers in the next interspeech because then you get your papers through. What we also thought we should look at at the, at the end was the job that all we all did and all the area chairs and all the reviewers are we going to be replaced by the algorithms that we are developing. So we try to model prediction with uh, deep neural networks uh, on the basis of purely the submission. So the abstract text, the, the country of affiliation, and readability scores on the abstract. At the moment, well, we've got a way to go. We have an F1 score of around 60 uh, on just the pure submission data. Of course, if you look at reviews, preliminary results show us that we can get 70 easily from a single review as well. So there's a time to go, but maybe something for the future. And with that, I thank you and welcome you to Graz, and please enjoy the technical program. <laughs> the next Voices and Piano piece will be to a speech from Marcel Duchamp. very definite theory, call it theory, so that I can be wrong, that a work of art exists only when the spectator has looked at it. Until then, it's only something that has been done that might disappear and nobody would know about it. But the spectator consecrates it by saying, this is good, we'll keep it. And the spectator, in that case, becomes posterity. It keeps the museums full of paintings, don't they, today? My impression is that these museums, called the Pardo, called the National Gallery, called the Blue, are only receptacles of things that have survived, probably mediocrities, because they happen to have survived is no reason to make them so important and big and beautiful and if there's no justification for that that label of beautiful they have survived why have they survived it's not because they are beautiful it's because they have survived by the law of chance and uh, i think my real feeling is that a work of art is only a work of art for a very short period. There's a life in a work of art which is short, even shorter than man's lifetime. I call it 20 years. After 20 years, an impressionist painting has ceased to be an impressionist painting because the, the material, the color, the paint has darkened so much. That's no more what the man did when he painted it. All right. That's one way of looking at it. So I apply this rule to all art, artworks. And they, after 20 years, are finished. Their life is over. They survive, all right, because they are curators of art history. And art history is not art. I don't believe in preserving. And I think, as I said, the work of art dies. It's a thing of contemporary life. In other words, in, in your life, you might see things. It, it's because it's contemporary with your life. It's been made at the same time as you were alive. And it has all the requisites of the definition of work of art, which is to make. And your contemporaries are making works of art. They are works of art at the time you live. But once you're dead, they die too. And the reason is that Ideas can survive more without distortion, without... Death is longer for ideas, because the language stays on for at least a few centuries. 
In other words, 50 years ago, we like this. 100 years ago, we like that. Showing the, the doubtful judgment of humanity on what's not. And that's why I like it to be only 20 years old. I have a short life. I didn't care. Yes, I learned it in Lille. I was lunching with a friend of mine who had it, and Miss Dryer. And she couldn't, she couldn't announce it to me. It was very funny. So, in fact, when she was so much moved by the fact that she had to announce it to me, my reaction was a, really a cold reaction to, to help her. You <laughs> see, of charity, <laughs> instead of despair. And it, it did. It was exactly like that. It was not despair at all. I had a very great form of philosophy of that kind to accept any matter as it comes. I mean, I'm not going to to fight it too much. I don't fight back. I'm against the word anti because it's very like atheist as compared to believer. And an atheist is just as much of a religious man as the believer is. And an anti-artist is just as much of an artist as the, the other artist. An artist would be much better if I could change it instead of anti-artist. A-N, artist, meaning no artist at all. That would be my conception. I don't mind being an, an, an artist. <laughs> Welcome. I'm John Hanson. I serve as the president of ISCA. I'd like to extend a warm uh, welcome to all of our friends, colleagues, and guests for the inter for Interspeech 2019, the first time that Interspeech has been in Austria, uh, truly representing the crossroads of speech and language. Just to give you a little bit of background, ISCA is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we exist uh, solely to provide support for the advancement of both science and technology in the field of speech communication. So we're here to provide support for you to learn as much as you possibly can and hear what you're going to uh, deliver this coming week in terms of your advancements in your research. I'd also like to particularly thank uh, the organizers, in particular uh, both Gernot and Stravko, as well as Bjorn and Thomas. Uh, if you go through an entire conference, you kind of assume that everything should go perfectly when things go the way they do, it's because someone actually paid enormous amounts of attention to all the details. With a conference this size, especially record number of attendees, record number of papers, this committee organized and moved very, very effectively over the last year, making sure that the papers were reviewed in a, the, the most professional way, as well as providing all the infrastructure and support for this conference to be such a great success. We hope you will enjoy that. I'd also like to extend a sincere thanks uh, to the sponsors and, and the exhibitors for Interspeech 2019. Your financial support directly goes to helping us ensure that we keep the registration costs low, as Gernot had noted, but it also provides direct support for our students and young researchers to attend Interspeech. Uh, I'll also make uh, one comment here. There are a couple things I'll, I'll highlight, but uh, during the uh, week, uh, I know you may focus on a particular area in your research. Please take a moment to, to uh, introduce yourself to at least three new people each day. Uh, go to one session that you would never have gone to. Learn something uh, new that you haven't seen before. And ask questions. We're all here to learn. So in terms of our uh, society, uh, I would like to extend uh, a sincere thanks to the Interspeech 2018 organizers in Hyderabad. Uh, they put on an, an outstanding program. This first time it was in India, and uh, the technical program and the logistics for uh, Hyderabad was just phenomenal. So we're very, very pleased and want to thank them for the great success they had uh, last year. Uh, I'll say, unfortunately, when looking at uh, uh, our society, uh, we have sometimes uh, people that pass away. So 
I'd like to uh, note uh, Sylvia Moosmuller, who was a, a faculty member here in Austria, uh, passed away last year. And I'll, I'll read uh, a, a note here from one of her colleagues. Uh, Sylvia Moosmuller uh, built up the Acoustic Phonetics Group here in the Acoustics Research Institute of the Australian Ac Academy, Academy of Sciences uh, and made significant contributions to the phonetic and phonological variation of Austrian German. Uh, she applied her expertise also in inter interdisciplinary research uh, projects on speech synthesis, machine translation for language uh, varieties. She was a passionate scientist and a treasured colleague. Uh, I also identified here a couple of the high uh, point uh, papers that she's published in her career. So I'd like to ask if we can take a moment of silence to recognize Sylvia Musmuller's contributions to the field. So moving on, uh, I'll give a brief update on the ISCA uh, state of our society. Uh, we will have more details this afternoon at 5 o'clock at the ISCA General Assembly. Uh, I was trying to figure out a way to encourage all of our attendees to uh, go to the General Assembly. I tried convincing the ISCA board that all the males needed to show up in Lederhosen and all the females in Dindles. Unfortunately, I couldn't convince the ISCA board to do this, but I encourage you to at least come to the ISCA General Assembly. You'll see a lot more details there, okay? Uh, so uh, for our society, uh, this is our board, uh, is it, uh, the uh, ISCA board for 2018-19. Uh, we had a number of folks that uh, were completing their service. Uh, so uh, Kai Berkling, Lori Lamal, and Satoshi Nakamura uh, completed their service uh, this year. And we had uh, an election, so three uh, board members were re-elected, uh, myself, Toroborn, and Sebastian. And for this coming year, we had uh, three new uh, elected uh, board members that, that included Margaret uh, Meg Zellers, uh, Chinhua uh, Tao, and Nobuaki uh, Minamatsu. Okay, there were three uh, new board members. And so, uh, so if you can... You can recognize them, thank you. Okay. Uh, and during the week here, we have a number of ISCA events that uh, I'd like to highlight. Uh, we already had the students and young, uh, or sorry, the, the travel uh, awards. So because of the support we, re uh, we received for this conference, uh, we had 60 uh, plus three awards for travel uh, support for students and young scientists. Uh, in terms of the events for this week, we had the doctoral consortium, which took place uh, on Saturday. We also had the workshop for young female researchers in speech science and technology, which also, which also took place on Saturday. We have the G ISCA General Assembly that takes place today at 5 o'clock. Uh, we also have the student uh, mentoring uh, program here at ISCA, uh, here at InterSpeech 2019. That'll take place on Tuesday from 4 to 6 if you're PhD student and you'd like to uh, know more about this, please uh, uh, attend. Uh, we also have the Students Meet Experts, uh, which takes place on Wednesday as well, uh, from 1.30 to 3.30. In terms of uh, our conferences, we have the next Interspeech 2020 taking place in Shanghai. You'll see a little bit more uh, about the organization of that Interspeech in the closing ceremony. Bruno will take place in 2021. You may have actually seen the announcement for 2022. But if you haven't, it's been on the ISCA pad several times. Uh, in 2022, we'll be going to Dublin, Ireland. Okay. Okay. And you'll hear more of these, uh, both all three of these uh, organizational committees in the closing ceremony. In terms of our membership, we continue to, uh, to grow and, and, and gather strength. Uh, we also in increase our di diversity. So we have, uh, over the last two years, over 2,200 uh, members uh, for ISCA and over 675 student members. So roughly one-third being students and two-thirds being uh, full, t full members. Um, and so that, that shows the vitality of our society. 
In terms of finances, we're in very good financial shape. We've actually planned, if you can believe this, for deficit spending. Since we are a nonprofit, we've attempted to try and get a negative uh, deficit or to get a deficit o in, in the operating process, but uh, we've been quite successful and we're looking at new opportunities to try and reach out and strengthen the programs here. We'll have more on the financial side uh, this afternoon. One of the uh, strategic areas that we put a lot of emphasis on this past year has been in diversity, uh, both recognizing and encouraging diversity of our membership and our community. So ISCA is committed to supporting all aspects of diversity in terms of membership community and member uh, recognition. The diversity areas, the first would be on gender diversity. That includes both membership, leadership uh, roles, as well as awards and recognition. Regional diversity, roughly about one third of our membership uh, is from the European area, Asia and Australia and North America. We obviously would like to expand and strengthen our uh, involvement in both South America and Africa. Uh, if you are from these continents, we would greatly encourage you to uh, participate and be involved. We would really like to see if we can bring an inner speech to these two continents. We also want to ensure a balance between both science and technology. Uh, we live on, uh, in an area of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, but course science integrated into these areas make it really critical for us to look at long-standing contributions to the field. And finally, balancing both the academic industry and government uh, sectors in terms of our uh, representation for membership. Our uh, diversity committee uh, was established this uh, past year, so Odette, Mark, and Julia as the external uh, member from our industrial, uh, from our IAC, uh, serve as the uh, diversity committee. Uh, this past year, they've been focused primarily on the gender side. In terms of uh, in, in ensuring high quality uh, and uh, uh, a safe uh, conference and workshop environment. We've instituted the code of conduct for conferences and workshop attendees. Uh, this is an important aspect to emphasize. We'll highlight a, a bit more of this in the ISCA General Assembly. But if you come across any, ex or if you experience uh, any aspect related to harassment, discrimination regarding either uh, gender, sexual orientation, race, religion, disability, or any physical aspects, uh, please uh, seek out, identify uh, one of the ISCA board members. You can send email to the ethics uh, uh, email address here, and all communications are held in, uh, confidentially, and uh, we will follow up on each of these uh, points that are raised. In addition to that, we also have a code of ethics for our authors. Uh, unfortunately, I think when we look at the competition it takes to get papers accepted, as Thomas pointed out, you may, if you can recruit 12 co-authors, maybe that increases your chances of getting a paper accepted. But uh, we also have to understand that we need to maintain uh, a high standard of ethics for the publication process. So we've established these guidelines here for authors to follow. These are posted on the ISCA website, and they're also a requirement of every ISCA event, uh, both inner speech and all the workshops. And we'll highlight a bit more of those uh, in, the, in the General Assembly. We have unfortunately been, been, uh, have identified uh, a, a couple of cases of papers that had to be uh, rejected because of uh, confidentiality issues. Uh, also, some highlights, we have the ISCA Web and Communications uh, Program. These look at the ISCA pad that comes out each month. Uh, Chris Willikens has been instrumental in overseeing that. We also have uh, SCOOT, uh, that's the Speech Communication Online Training System that both Kai uh, had been in heavily involved in as well as uh, Phil Green and several other uh, folks have been involved in communicating, uh, increasing the communications aspects here, both through the web and through online systems. Uh, we also have a very, very active uh, student advisory committee. Uh, if you are a student attending InterSpeech, please seek out uh, one of the student uh, members here. We very, very much would like to have you involved in the student uh, SAC uh, committee. Uh, now we'll move on to the awards program. So in terms of awards, we're going to first look at the Best Student Paper Awards. We have 13 finalists uh, that will be presenting their papers the next uh, four days. Uh, one today, there will be three uh, tomorrow. So we'll highlight these also in the uh, General Assembly. Uh, we have three for Wednesday that will be presented. And quite a few on Thursday. There's three here on Thursday, which is the first set, and additional three uh, on Thursday as well. So a total of 13 uh, papers that will be uh, presented and voted on by the uh, Student uh, Best Paper uh, Review Committee. In addition to that, we also have uh, our Fellows Program. 
So I'll just highlight briefly what the fellows program exists. We have, uh, we first seek out nominations from the ISCA community, so anyone can nominate someone for an ISCA fellow. Online webpage uh, and uh, application process is, is on our, our webpage. We include uh, four external review, uh, fellow review uh, reference letters that are included with each application, and a separate ISCA fellows committee is used uh, to both review and, and vote on the ISCA fellow uh, awards. So I'd like to ask uh, Hema Murthy if she could uh, join us up on stage uh, to uh, identify the uh, ISCA fellows uh, so we can present their awards. Okay, everything. So you're gonna read. You're gonna read the uh, the names. Yeah. Yeah, the first one is from Martin Ada Decker. There's no order here, and uh, she receives the uh, fellowship for contributions in to multilingual speech processing, and large scale corpus based linguistics, and for bridging communities. Martin Ada Decker. Jennifer Cole for theoretical and for theoretical and experimental descriptions of the sources of phonological and prosodic variability in spontaneous speech. Mark Gales for wide-ranging fundamental contributions to research and leadership in the fields of speech recognition, synthesis, and statistical modeling algorithms. Mark Gales. Yanis Talianov for contributions to speech analysis, speech modification, and speech communication. Christian Bellikens for pioneering contributions in the use of neural networks in automatic speech recognition and education activity in speech science. Valerie Hazen for contributions to speech perception and production. And finally, Douglas O'Shaughnessy for contributions to automatic speech recognition and leadership in the speech community. And uh, yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, uh, Doug is still traveling here, so he's not able to make it. So he asked me to accept it on his behalf. So 
<laughs> Maybe you want to present it to me. I'll help. Thank you, Hema. So I would also kind of point out that in looking at our ISCA fellows, uh, we started back in 2008 in recognizing the ISCA fellow program. We now have 75 ISCA fellows that span the globe uh, and all areas, both in terms of science, technology, uh, every aspect one can imagine. Uh, and so uh, we will uh, uh, continue to, to uh, expand on the program this way. So, Next, uh, we move to the ISCA Scientific Medal. Uh, the, this medal represents the highest achievement uh, awarded by ISCA. Uh, the medal uh, recognizes and honors an individual each year who has made extraordinary contributions to the field of speech communication, science, and technology. The process for the ISCA Medal uh, program, we first seek uh, nominations from the ISCA community. Uh, this is due by January 1st. These full nominations are then reviewed by the ISCA board uh, with a blind voting process, and all the criteria are, are listed on the ISCA website. And so it's obviously, if you're only recognizing one person each year, uh, it's a challenge because we have many, many people that are making outstanding and long-standing contributions to the field of speech communication. This year, our winner is Kaichi Takuda. And uh, this right side, yeah. so this is for pioneering statistical uh, parameter approaches in speech synthesis and for leadership in the provision of enabling software tools. It's been the tradition that uh, we try to bring someone who is an expert in the area to say a few words about the ISCA uh, medalist. So I've asked Alan Black if he could uh, come to the podium to say a few words about the significance and impact that Kiichi has had uh, to the community. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor and pleasure to um, have uh, Professor Keiichi Takuda um, win the scientific medal. Um, I always like to see contributions to speech synthesis, of course, and uh, we've been colleagues and friends for over 20 years, and so this is good to see um, uh, his contributions actually recognized. Professor uh, uh, Takuda uh, got his PhD from Tokyo Institute of Technology, sometime in the previous millennium, I can't remember when. Um, and for most of his career, he's been at Nagoya Institute of Technology um, with a number of visits, including at ATR and at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, one of the things, maybe a, a little point to the uh, younger members of the audience, one of the ways to be successful um, in a field is to have good citations and building a new metric building data sets, building toolkits are a good way to get citations and a good way to become famous. But the thing that's actually really hard is coming up with fundamentally new algorithms for ways to doing, do things. And Tokuda Sensei's work on HMM synthesis, statistical parametric synthesis, was really a fundamentally different way in doing generative synthesis. It was the first time people considered doing generation from statistical models to produce speech. That work has continued into the latest um, uh, neural network, but um, his work uh, over the 90s and into the 2000s um, gave us the chance to have controllable synthesis, gave us a chance to have data-driven synthesis at a level that we didn't really have before, and so I think this is an important contribution that's been recognized. And of course, it's not just the algorithmic aspect of Takuda Sensei's work, it's the fact that he um, led a number of uh, pretty famous students um, uh, through their careers, um, and of course, provided a toolkit so that other people could build on top of that work. So at this point, I'd like to introduce um, 
talk to Sensi. So Professor uh, Takuda-sensei will be giving a keynote, a keynote talk uh, right after the uh, completion of this program here. So uh, that concludes the ISCA com uh, component here. Uh, the next uh, music uh, uh, portion will be uh, presented by, uh, boy, Hannes Galula, right? Voices and piano. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Also mir hat mein Name immer sehr gut gefallen, Hanna, das war für mich immer dieses Hanna. Und irgendwie denke ich schon, dass in meinem Leben dieses dass das, dass das eine, eine Aufgabe in meinem Leben war, dass ich so richtig zum Ausatmen komme. Weil angefangen habe ich eigentlich andersrum, da habe ich mehr eingeatmet als ausgeatmet. Ich habe immer mehr aufgenommen, als ich von mir äh, gegeben habe. Als Kind natürlich nicht, aber später dann. Und auch der anderen, eben auch Shigula, der Name, äh, <lacht> dieses dass das so hell anfängt und dann Ulla, dass das so, so sich ausruht in so einer Kugel und dass es dann wieder in einem A endet. Ich denke schon, dass, dass äh, die Klänge einen selber auch zum Klingen bringen. Jetzt speziell, äh, wenn man dann den eigenen Namen auch so oft schreibt oder auch oft hört. Meine Mutter wollte mich anfangs Dagmar nennen. Da bin ich ja sehr froh, dass sie das nicht gemacht hat. Das war, ich bin ja geboren 43, das war ja noch in der Nazizeit. Da war natürlich Dagmar eine sehr sichere Sache, dass sie mich dann ausgerechnet Hanna genannt hat. Ein Name, der mich später eigentlich sehr weit getragen hat, weil viele gedacht haben, vielleicht ist sie auch jüdisch. Oft ist mir der Name zurückgekommen mit einem H wieder am Ende. Das ist ja schon von der Schreibung sehr schön. So war es aber nicht. Aber das fand ich doch sehr mutig, dass sie damals in der Zeit mich Hanna genannt hat. Meine Mutter hat immer gesagt, wenn ich sie gefragt habe, ach, da gab es eine Hanna, die war so schön. <lacht> Aber ob das alles war, weiß ich nicht. Jedenfalls, der Name hat mir immer gefallen.
So before concluding this morning session, I will give you some updates of more practical nature. Lots of people have asked what about the badges and the faces on them. Well, they are faces of various Austrian scientists with uh, some of them having a strong relationship to Graz. But we use them to encode actually your admission rights to various, uh, various social events or to the Yapstick book that about half of you have opted for. So you can read this on our web page and also in our conference app. There will be social events, and I start from the back with the dancing interspeech story on Wednesday night. Uh, due to the huge number of participants we see already today, we had to look also for a secondary location, uh, which is just opposite the main location. And uh, so in the main location, you will have food and dance and music. And in the secondary location, you have a museum and wine tasting. So make use of both of them. You will be allowed to freely float between the two. We will also organize additional tram rides to bring you from here, from Stadthalle to Stefaninsaal. And one other thing that needs some preparation on your side is, essentially, we will only have standing tables at these events. If you really need a seat, please request so at the registration desk, and you will get a special ticket for it, because we have only very, very limited seating options. Uh, tonight, we have not only the ISCA General Assembly from 5 to 6.30, but the welcome reception right here in this building in the lower level for years. And then if you look in that direction, there is an outdoor area called the Messe Park. And we will enjoy some folk music, finger food, and drinks. And you will learn what the Austrian word Sturm means. The solution to this riddle stands at the bottom of this page, but I suggest you rather come to the event and try for yourself. To give you an idea of the building, just as a quick orientation, we are now here in the main hall. In front of the main hall, the yellow area is the exhibition area, which is also one of our coffee break areas. Coffee breaks will be always held at the exhibition areas. The orange stuff is essentially lunch areas. Starting from the right, there's a bistro way beyond the registration. You leave the building, and then you have a very nice uh, bistro with even some patio seating. We have a huge cafeteria right on that side of the main hall, and there will be food trucks in the Messe Park outside. On the second floor, we have most uh, of our uh, the lecture halls, the gallery with the posters, again, an exhibition area for coffee breaks, and another smaller restaurant uh, on the highest level, also marked here in orange. So these are four options inside the building that you can choose. But next to these four options inside the building, uh, we also have included a lunch map in your abstract book and on the conference app. So within 15 minutes walking radius, there's a lot of different places to sample. And if you jump on one of the trams, uh, it's about eight minutes to the city center, and then you have all opportunities uh, you like. Uh, regarding water, the water in Graz comes directly from Alpine Mountain Springs, so it's safe and delicious to drink. And whenever you see one of the coffee bars here in that building, they also provide this very nice water for free. You can get glasses, but you can also freely fill your own bottles and carry this water with you. That's the most convenient way to do. For us, the poster sessions were not just a challenge, but also a way to use it for what I would call an art exhibition. So we had 160 students of architecture who would actually design uh, special poster walls that combine both aesthetics and the acoustic uh, comfort of you into a very nice design. So it's actually an exhibition with an exhibition catalog where you can uh, watch all these 160 different designs. And we thank a lot our colleague from architecture, Milena Stavridge, and our sound engineer, Jamila Balint, for organizing this excellent project. The conference app and abstract book are also accessible. Only half of you opted for a printed abstract book. Everybody else will use the conference app. But I suggest also that uh, uh, those who have a conference uh, book still use the app, because we will occasionally push important messages to you. We will not overload you with such messages, but uh, be aware that uh, this is one way to communicate with you. And don't forget to visit the real clock tower to compare it to our tiny clock tower that you received as a USB stick. Finally, 
When you looked at our webpage, Wolfgang von Kampelen was inviting you to come to Graz. He wrote his book uh, in uh, Vienna, actually, which now is available in an English translation. He could be called like an 18th century Leonardo da Vinci because he was not only an inventor and engineer, but also a droid, poet, and public administrator. So he had many different skills, and his contribution is, of course, strongly rooted in the development, the first development of acoustic phonetic experiments and theory, the validation of that theory through a mechanical simulator and the open hardware publication of the simulator that allows us still today to reproduce research that was done 230 years ago. And we had an event in Vienna bringing together five such demonstrators of his uh, system, and one of them is shown in the next short movie. So this short movie by Silke Berdox and Alexander Steinbeiser shows that the documentation of uh, this work was sufficient to actually build a replica that can really convince us that he understood about all the sound generation mechanism at the time. We will use this today for the concluding performance of this uh, session. So what we did just here is a mechanical simulator of the human voice will now be turned into an electronic simulation of the audio that we just heard, and that will finally be rendered using a so-called automatic piano or robot piano player. It's again Winfried Rich, who will kind of show us how that kind of voice that dates 230 years uh, can be played today with an artistic touch. He will do. Yep. Ah, yep. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Talking about Kempelen, we will conclude with a short note on him. The source filter model of speech production. Acoustic phonetic theory developed empirically and validated through mechanical simulation, reproducible research manifested in an open source description of the simulator blueprint. And now we will conclude this with a live demonstration of the methods that are behind that system, which is essentially a kind of harmonic analysis of the real-time audio signal produced by myself and converted into the mechanical excitation of the piano keys. So at this point, 
I thank you again for coming here today to this opening session of Interspeech 2019, and I declare this conference for opened. Thank you. Winfried Ritsch. <laughs>